So you just picked up yourself a Denon or Moran 7.2 channel AVR. Congratulations! Maybe you're upgrading from a soundbar system or perhaps you had a traditional 5.1 system but then you decided, you know what, I want to see what this Dolby Atmos is all about. Whatever the case may be, you might be a little bit intimidated with the new menu system that is featured in the new line of cinema, AVRs from Marantz, and the new Denon line that just came out in 2022. So without further ado, let's go over some scenarios you might want with your own system. This video is sponsored by Crutchfield, but more on that later in the video. First off, we need to press the setup button on the remote. That brings up the setup menu. There's not much in the audio section, but we'll go over that first. As you can see, the only one that I can go into is volume, so we'll do that. The scale of the volume can be, if you press the enter button, you can change it from zero to 98 to decibels. I particularly prefer decibels because I have an audio engineering background, so we deal with decibels all the time. So that is what I want. So I will keep it that way, but you can do whatever you want. You can have a limit. Uh, zero decibels being zero decibels full scale, which is a digital scale. So that is actually the loudest that it will go with this limit. So you can change that limit to whatever you want, or you can just have it off if you don't want a limit at all. Power on level will turn on to the volume that it was at when you last turned it off in this position, or you can just have it muted when it powers on, or you can set a particular decibel level or volume level when it does turn on every time. Me personally, I just like to have it turn on to what it was when I last turned it off. And if you mute the system, full means it'll mute it completely, so it'll be totally silent. Or you can mute it where it's pretty darn quiet, or even less quiet, or once again, just back to completely silent. I like to have mute on completely silent, so I'll keep it that way. Go back, video. Let's go to HDMI setup, HDMI audio out. Yes, we want that to be the AVR because the AVR is what is feeding our speakers. Otherwise you can have it coming out of your TV, but that just doesn't make sense to me because I want the audio coming out of my nice speakers, not my TV speakers. So I'll keep it on AVR. Moving on, HDMI pass-through. Uh, HDMI pass-through is probably gonna be used less than you think. Basically, HDMI pass-through means that it will pass through audio to your TV so it plays through your TV speakers. Say if it's like late at night and you don't want to wake up anybody by blaring your incredibly cool home theater system at full volume or whatever. This way, you can still have something connected to it like a Blu-ray player, a streaming media device, etc., and it'll pass through that audio to your TV so it's just coming out of your TV speakers. So it bypasses your speaker system. And you can choose which particular HDMI input reacts to that pass-through. Uh, because as you can see on the back, all of the HDMI inputs are labeled as such cable, satellite, media player, BD player, game, etc which you can also customize. You can name them what you want. But as far as the labels themselves that have been etched into the AVR itself, it's going to be labeled with these labels, cable, satellite, media player, etc. Right now I have an Apple TV 4K hooked up to my AVR. So I will just say pass through source will be media player. But honestly, I, this is in my dedicated theater. So I don't really have to worry about volume. You, on the other hand, may need to worry about volume late at night if your kids are in bed or your wife is in bed or whatever. So you may want to have HDMI pass through on. Otherwise, you can just turn it off. Moving on, HDMI control. This is your CEC commands. So that way, if you want to change the volume of the AVR with your TV remote, just to make it that much easier, you don't have to worry about having so many remotes on hand, you can say on. Ta-da! But it is pretty interesting if you turn HDMI control on, boom, that automatically turns HDMI pass through on, as you can see above. So once again, I'll just leave it on media player, whatever. It also automatically engages arc. See if I have it off, you can still tell it to turn on arc. If you're not familiar, arc is the ability to send audio from your TV to 
your AVR and out to your speakers. Say if you have a media player or a Blu-ray player or a gaming console hooked up directly into your TV, but you still wanna have Dolby Atmos going out to your system, you wanna have ARC on so that it feeds that high bandwidth audio signal to your AVR, which then sends it out to your speakers. So let's continue with this HDMI control we want on. Once again, it automatically turns ARC on. TV audio switching selects the TV audio input automatically when receiving a command from the TV. I really like that, um, especially with gaming consoles. So that way, if I just turn on one of my wireless controls on my Nintendo Switch, it automatically turns the TV on and then switches to the Nintendo Switch input. So I particularly like that because I, I want to be able to do that. Just pick up a controller and have it automatically switch to the Nintendo Switch. Power off control. Yeah, I want to have all of them. Power saving. If you do want to save some power, you can turn that on if you'd like. But whatever, I'll just keep it off in this case. Okay, let's go back. And since we changed some things, it's thinking a little bit. Input assigned. This is where you can kind of customize your inputs, your HDMI inputs in particular, and your some of your analog inputs, etc. on the rear. You can assign what it will accept. Like for a cable satellite in particular, you can have it accept everything, or you can have it accept just HDMI or just digital, like optical or coax, just analog. So I like to keep it on auto. And then you can also assign if it is digital, will it accept coax or will it accept optical? So I don't really need to change any of these in my particular setup, but you are more than welcome to do whatever you want in this case. Source rename. This is what I was talking about earlier. The inputs are etched on the back as follows, but you can change them to whatever you want. Say if you have a cable or satellite, you can say it's an Xfinity cable box. Or you can make this cable satellite one your Blu-ray player because it is HDMI input one. So you can make this whatever you want. So we can say delete, delete. Let's say X. Fin. T. Whatever. Oh, okay. Now it's thinking. Yeah, so now that says Xfinity. So whatever, you can customize all you want. Care to customize myself? So I'm just gonna move on. Apparently you can hide some sources. As you can see at the bottom, selects source inputs to hide on the user interface and front panel displays. You can do that if you want. <laughs> I personally don't see any reason to, so I'm not going to. Source level, adjust the input level for the current source. Again, you can customize this. Say if um, one is particularly louder than the other, like say if your gaming console always seems to be way louder than if you're just watching TV or something. But then again, I usually don't like to mess with anything like that. I just will turn it down if it sounds too loud. You can do what you like. Speakers, all right. We will skip Odyssey setup, go to manual setup. Amp assign. All right, here we go, baby. Okay, assign mode. It defaults to surround back, which means you have a seven ear level speaker configuration where you've got left, center, right, two surrounds and two surround backs, as you can see in this graphic here. And you can also see that you can still set up a zone two with this configuration, but you can see at the bottom of the speakers in the graphic, that they say pre, so you can hook up some RCA cables. So as you can see with view terminal config, they're all lit up. So say if you want seven ear level speakers, which since you have a 7.2 channel AVR, you are going to be maxing out your processing capabilities with seven ear level speakers. So if you would like to set up a zone two, you have to use the pre outs, which are located here on the rear panel. So you connect some RCA cables to your zone two pre outs, and then connect those to a two channel external amp, which then powers your two channel zone two speakers. But the only limitation with this is that since you are using seven ear level speakers in your main zone, which maxes out the processing capabilities, 
If you were to listen to two channel music in zone two, you would have to do that separately. Meaning you can't listen to something in surround sound in the main zone and something in zone two simultaneously, because that would be exceeding its processing limitations. That would technically be nine channels that it would be processing, which it can't do, sorry. Okay, zone two is if you want to create a main zone and a two channel zone two, and you don't have an external amp to power that zone two. You want to actually utilize the internal amps of your seven channel AVR. So that is possible if you only have a 5.1 setup in the main zone and then a zone two in another room. So when you do that, as you can see here, your main zone will be powered by the internal amps that are labeled front, center, and surround. And then you can use the surround back internal amps to power your zone two, as you can see how it's labeled here. Ta-da! Moving on, by amp. If you have some really nice tower speakers, as you can see in the graphic next to those tower speakers, it says by a which stands for by amp because you are independently powering your high frequencies and your low frequencies separately. And that is when you are utilizing the internal amps to do that. So let's take a look at view terminal config. So now you can see front by amp is now part of the equation. You can see it on the left and the right side of this graphic here. So it doesn't really matter which one you assign as high frequency and low frequency, just make sure and keep track of which ones you are plugging them into physically. So for example, the left side, I would probably plug into the low frequencies. So front right low frequencies, front left low frequencies, and then over on the surround back internal amps, I would then do front right high frequencies and front left high frequencies. Does that make sense? But since you're maximizing the processing power of this seven channel AVR, once again, zone two, you would have to use pre-outs and an external amp. Is this starting to make sense now? Front B, this is if maybe you're wanting to demo two different speakers. Maybe you wanna see which one sounds better. So as you can see here with the speaker config, on the left hand side, you can see front A, and on the right hand side, you can see front B. That's how you would connect both sets of front speakers, which once again, utilizes all seven channels of processing power. So if you would still want zone two, you would have to use the pre-outs. Moving on, front height. Ooh, I bet this is what a lot of you are looking for. Now that you're getting into Dolby Atmos, see, as you can see underneath that main zone, it says support format, Dolby Atmos and DTSX. Hooray. So this is being able to utilize all seven internal amps to support a 5.1.2 immersive audio configuration. So I do appreciate how the graphic just kind of spells that out pretty clearly. Once again, zone two is going to be utilized via pre-outs only because you are maximizing the processing power of your seven channel AVR. Once again, let's go down to view terminal config. You've got your front, center, and surrounds, and you use the surround back internal amps to power your front height speakers. Moving on from there. And as you can see, these are speakers that are mounted up high on the wall. Because when we move on, top front, ah, okay. This is when you actually have speakers mounted to the ceiling or you have in ceiling speakers pointing towards your listening position. And just like with front height, you got your front, center, and surrounds and then you use the surround back internal amps to power your top front speakers. Moving on top middle, which by the way, I have personally gone over this and also Technodad has gone over this. So if you're limited to only two height channels for the best height effects, meaning they are literally sounding like they are above you, if at all possible, you definitely wanna to use top middle and you definitely want them straight above your listening position, either mounted above you or in ceiling speakers straight above you. That is honestly going to get the best immersive experience if you only are limited to two height speakers. I know it's not possible for everyone, but if you can, please set up your height speakers directly above your listening position. And once again, if we view terminal config, got your front, center, surrounds, and your surround backs will be powering your top, middle, 
height speakers. Moving on, if you have upward firing speakers, say they're sitting on top of the tower speakers like they are in this graphic here, shooting audio up to the ceiling and bouncing it towards your listening position, then you would wanna choose front Dolby because that will tell your AVR, oh, I have to account for sound bouncing off the ceiling and not coming directly at the listening position. And just like the previous configurations, once again, you are using the surround back internal amps to power your front Dolby upward firing speakers. Moving on, we have surround Dolby, where you would actually have them placed on your surrounds, shooting up to the ceiling and down. And just like having top middle height speakers, when you're limited to two height channels, you can obviously experiment all you want. But I would honestly try surround Dolby first if you happen to have upward firing speakers. See how that sounds first, then experiment with front Dolby and see whatever sounds best in your particular situation, since everybody's living room or home theater area is going to be different. And once again, to power your surround Dolby upward firing speakers, you will be utilizing the surround back internal amps. And that's about it as far as the amp assign mode, because now we're back to where we started, surround back. Okay, moving on to speaker configuration. In the amp assign, I had it set to surround back, so it's going to be seven ear level speakers. But you might have noticed that when we were in amp assign, there was no 5.1. Although let me back up a little bit, because when we were in amp assign, Technically, the only time that you had five ear level speakers is when you were in this zone two. So that automatically made the main zone only have five speakers because you had to power your two channel zone two with the remaining two internal amps. But say, for example, you want seven ear level speakers and you have a two channel external amp to power a two channel zone two. So for amp assign, we would go back to surround back because we want zone two to have that pre as it's labeled here on this little graphic. So let's go back to speaker configuration. By default, your front are set to small, which as you can see are smaller speakers that are on speaker stands, or you can set it to large if you have large towers. The only caveat to setting them too large is that you cannot set the crossovers anymore, which we will be getting into a little bit later. Setting them too large automatically tells the system, hey, I have beefy tower speakers that have big old woofers in them that can handle low frequencies all themselves. They are full band speakers, so they can do, I don't know, 25 or 30 or 40 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz or 30 kilohertz, whatever. That's what you're telling the AVR to do if you are setting your front speakers too large. Even if you have tower speakers, but you still want the ability to change crossovers, set it to small. I know the graphic doesn't represent it correctly or accurately, because if you have tower speakers, this represents that they're just little speakers on speaker stands. But regardless, if you have tower speakers, but you still want the flexibility of changing your crossovers, just set them to small. The thing about this speaker configuration page is that it is where you can customize things because amp assign is kind of a general sense of certain configurations, but your speaker configuration page is where you can customize it just a little bit more. Because as you can see, center, you can set to small or none because maybe you don't have a center channel. Maybe you do have some surrounds, some surround backs and two front speakers, but you don't have a center channel. You can set it up like so in the speaker configuration page. But we do have a center channel, so let's keep that to small. All right, just a little bit interesting thing about a seven channel Denon or Moran's AVR. Say that if you don't have a subwoofer, if you change it to no, then as you can see, it automatically switches your front speakers to large. Because if you don't have a subwoofer, it just assumes you're getting your low frequencies from large tower speakers that are full bandwidth. So if you actually do have small speakers up front and you don't have a subwoofer, for whatever reason, the software just doesn't agree that that's a possibility. <laughs> you know, if you set it to small and you don't have a subwoofer, it's like, nope, 
that's not possible. That must mean you have large tower speakers up front. So whatever, it's just one of those little software quirks. But since we do have a subwoofer, and I imagine all of you at least have one subwoofer, either because you have a bundle that you got, or you just happen to have a subwoofer lying around with the speakers you've got. In this case, we'll just say we have one subwoofer, yes. All right, and say that you have just a 3.1 system where you've got left, center, right, and a subwoofer. This is where you would assign that. Like I said, the amp assign section is very generalized with particular configurations that you can start from, but speaker configuration is where you do more of the customization. So if you have a 3.1 setup, you would set your surrounds to none. And as you can see in the graphic, left, center, right, subwoofer, 3.1. But since we do have surrounds, we're going to say they are small. And if you want seven ear level speakers as opposed to two height channels, then this is where you would assign the surround back channels. But interestingly enough, you can actually assign one surround back channel. Say if you just have one that is directly behind you. Typically, you're going to have two surround back channels, but back in the day, a 6.1 configuration was possible with a DTS Neo 6, I think it was called, but that's kind of gone away. But if you prefer this, then by all means, go for it. But we're going to stick with this. So that's at least going over a little bit of some different scenarios you might come across if you want seven ear level speakers or you've already set up the quote unquote, surround back amp assign mode. So let's go back, because I know a lot of you are probably wanting 5.1.2 configuration because you want to get into Dolby Atmos. So if you had set up, let's say, a 5.1.2 configuration with your height speakers mounted up high, sure, let's go with that. We'll go back to speaker configuration, front small, center small, subwoofer yes, surround small, front height, small, or you can say none, which doesn't really make any sense. But I guess this is just another way that you can get a 5.1 configuration done. But if you've chosen the front height amp assign mode, it seems kind of silly to not actually use your front heights. Although this is one way to disengage the front heights, say if you are just trying to test some things, this is an easy way to disengage them without actually having to disconnect them physically. So if you have front height set to none, it just won't send any information to those front height speakers. So yeah, this I guess is just good for testing purposes. But since we do want them, we're gonna set them to small. And it's kind of redundant, but I'll just go over it anyway, just in case. But it's basically the same for any other height configuration, top front, top middle, let's say top middle, right? If we go into speaker configuration, you've got your front, center, subwoofer, surrounds, top middle, set to small, or you can set them to none again. But say if you're troubleshooting and you aren't getting any sound coming out of your height speakers, double check your speaker configuration and make sure that the top middles are in fact set to small. Because maybe for some reason you might have accidentally set them to none, and you're not getting any sound out of them. So just double check that they are set to small so, and they are showing in the graphic. So then you should be able to hear something coming out of them. Just a little troubleshooting tip. And the same goes for upward firing. Your front Dolby, for example, if you go to speaker configuration, you've got your fronts, your center, your subwoofer, your surrounds, and your front Dolby is set to small or none. So same thing, pretty much identical to the other configurations when we're dealing with height speakers. All right, distances. You can change the unit from feet to meters, depending on where you are in the world, which is convenient. You can also change the step intervals to 0.1 feet, one foot, and in the case of meters, 0.1 meters, 0.01 meters. But in my case, I'm using feet, so we'll do that. Typically, your distances will be more accurate when you run Odyssey or perhaps Dirac Live, if you have one of the newer, more expensive Denons or Marantz's, and you've purchased the additional license for Dirac Live. Because if we back out of here, Odyssey setup, that's where you would do the auto room calibration setup with Odyssey. Because that's when you set up the calibration microphone, and it will then play some test tones, which will then more accurately get a sense of where your main listening position is, 
and how far away your speakers are from that main listening position. But going into the manual setup, going into the distances allows you to tweak it just a little bit because it's not only a representation of the physical distances between your listening position and your speakers, but also the acoustic distance. Because say if you have in-wall speakers or you've set up your speakers and there's no possible way that you can actually move the speakers anymore, if you're needing to dial in the imaging just a little bit more, you would use the distances to fine tune your imaging even more. Does that make sense? So running Odyssey first will get those distances and set delays to your speakers so that they are reaching your main listening position simultaneously. Because you're dealing with a lot of speakers and your surrounds are most likely going to be closer to you than your front speakers. So distances, think of it as a combination of physical distance and acoustic distances and setting delays to get all the sounds arriving to your main listening position at the same time. So say if I'm sitting directly in the center of the system and the sound that's coming out of my front left speaker sounds a little bit too far left, like it doesn't sound exactly like it's coming from the speaker itself. It sounds like it's coming from this little phantom image a little bit outside of the speaker itself. You might want to manually adjust the distances to better align the acoustic properties. I hope this is making sense. <laughs> so in order to actually know that you are getting a more proper alignment, this is a little bit more technical than you maybe want to deal with. But say if you have the ability to generate pink noise, whether that be through REW or perhaps the Spatial Audio Room Calibration Toolkit, you can play pink noise through your speakers and be able to adjust the imaging of that pink noise and dial it in just a little bit more accurately if you were to manually change the distances on this page. Because if we back out of this, we can run pink noise via the levels page. See how it says test tone start, and then you'll be able to hear See, now you can hear some pink noise coming through the front left, center, front right. But the only downside is we can't adjust the distances or the acoustic properties while we're listening to the pink noise that the AVR itself is outputting. So you would need like a calibration disc or like I said before, like running REW, pink noise which is a free download, by the way, REW on your laptop or desktop computer, whatever. So like I said, this is definitely more of a technical troubleshooting step than you might care about. But let's go back, speaking of levels, because after you run Odyssey, Odyssey will automatically set the levels so that according to your main listening position and the microphone that was set up there during the Odyssey calibration, it's going to set the levels accordingly so that they're all reaching the main listening position at the same volume. But say if you wanted to manually double check that, say if you have a DB Meter Pro app on your phone, or once again in REW, you can check the levels of your ear level speakers by playing these test tones and making sure they're all set to the same decibel level as you go through and play pink noise through all these speakers. Yeah, so as you can see, surround right is gonna be a little bit quieter than the front, center, and right, just because my surround right is closer to my ear than the other speakers. So just another troubleshooting step that you can manually go back and do after Odyssey has automatically attempted to calibrate your system according to your room. All right, crossovers. As you can see, all of my crossovers are set to the THX standard 80 hertz. So anything 80 hertz and above will be played out of the speakers, my main ear level speakers, and anything 80 hertz and below will be played through the subwoofer or subwoofers if you happen to have two. Now, some of you may want to adjust your crossovers according to how low your speakers can go when it comes to their frequency response, which you will always be able to find in the specifications, either online or in the manual, etc. Say, for example, if it was 40 hertz, if you want to set a crossover according to your speaker 
rule of thumb is 10 to 20 hertz above the lowest frequency that your speaker can handle. So if your speaker can handle down to 40 hertz, you might be able to change it depending on your AVR, because some AVRs like this one in particular, it goes in 20 hertz increments. If your speaker can handle down to 40 hertz, 10 to 20 hertz above that is obviously going to be 60 hertz. This particular one doesn't do 50 hertz. It just doesn't give me that option. So I will just stick with 60 hertz. But this is obviously something you definitely want to experiment with. Yes, you can set your crossovers according to what your speaker can actually handle, but your system might actually end up sounding better if it's a more cohesive sound. Because as you can see, all of my speakers are set to 80 hertz because I want it to sound more cohesive. I don't particularly want my speakers up front to be able to dip down a little bit more because then it might mess with the cohesiveness of the system as a whole. But it's totally up to you. You could set your front sound stage, your left, center, and right. You can set yours to 60 hertz and then have your surrounds and surround backs be 80 hertz. That's totally fine. Maybe in your particular situation, it just sounds better to you. Because going through all these steps, there is no right or wrong. It just depends on how you like to have your system sound. Maybe your surrounds and your surround backs are pretty small. So maybe you want to set them to 100 hertz or perhaps 120 hertz. So there's basically just two camps here. Either you want cohesiveness or you want to have certain speakers outputting more frequencies than others. Just depends on how you prefer your sound to be. So me personally, I'm just gonna leave them all at 80 hertz. Boom, done. Bass. You can set the subwoofer output to LFE, which basically means the low frequency effects. That's what LFE stands for. Any movie soundtrack or TV show soundtrack is going to have an LFE track. It is low frequency effects assigned specifically for a subwoofer. So any of those types of effects will be automatically sent to the subwoofer when LFE is selected. As you can see at the bottom, it says the subwoofer outputs receive the LFE track, like I said before, plus any redirected bass from speakers with crossover set. So as you saw on the previous page, all of my crossovers were set to 80 Hertz. So anything that was sent to the ear level speakers, 80 Hertz and below, is also going to be sent to the subwoofers. And as you can see here, I can actually set the low pass filter. That's what LPF stands for, low pass filter. It is allowing any low frequencies to pass through to the subwoofer. Because I have also set that to 80 Hertz. So that way anything 80 Hertz and below will be sent to the subwoofer but you can set it to 120 hertz. Perhaps in your particular room or your system, perhaps 120 hertz is necessary, but I'm gonna keep mine at 80 hertz. But one other thing to acknowledge is that you can change this to LFE plus main. And as you can see at the bottom, the subwoofer outputs receive the LFE track as normal, plus redirected bass and a copy of the low frequency signals from all large speakers. So if you have big towers up front and you did set them to large in the speaker configuration page, a copy of those low frequency signals will also be sent to the subwoofers, which once again, I have assigned to 80 Hertz and below. So your front towers will be playing low frequency signals and the subwoofer will be playing low frequency signals. So you've got a bunch of low frequencies coming at you. So one reason you might wanna do this is say you've got some big old beefy tower speakers up front that can handle all the way down to, I don't know, 25, 30 Hertz. So you're getting a lot of low frequency signals coming through your towers. And maybe you've got two subwoofers in the back corners of your living room. So that way you've got low frequencies coming from your front and low frequencies coming from your back. So then you're immersed just a little bit more with low frequencies that way. That's not exactly a common thing to do, but it's good to know it is possible if you want to experiment with something like that. But for now, I'm just going to leave it to LFE because I want low frequency effects and anything 80 hertz and below to be sent to the subwoofer. 
As you can see, front speaker is grayed out because at the bottom, you can see it selects the front speaker configuration. It can only be set when amp assign is set to front B, when you have that additional set of front speakers. Say if you wanted to A, B those speakers and find out which one is better, say if you're testing two different sets of speakers. We'll get to speaker connection in a little bit, but first let's go to speaker preset. You can actually have up to two different presets. Say if you have a particular preset for watching movies and maybe another one for video games or something. So this is where you can choose between those two different presets. All right, now that we've done that, what I've been using this whole time is a Marantz Cinema 70S which you can get easily and hassle-free through this video sponsor, Crutchfield. But I'm gonna be honest with you, even way before I made this deal with Crutchfield, anytime I need to look up specs, frequency responses, speaker sensitivity, if it supports RO3D or IMAX enhanced or not, whether it has Dirac Live or Odyssey, whatever. I cannot stress enough how easy it is to dissect all this information on Crutchfield's website. The layout is super clean, but in addition to that, no matter what product you're looking up, you can always find this tab here that says articles, which then gives you a ton of information about things that you may need help with. So like I said before, even way before Crutchfield decided to sponsor any of my videos, I would go to Crutchfield in order to search for things as opposed to Google. So the amount of information and knowledge you can get from just this one website is just a gold mine. You can easily find yourself going down a rabbit hole with all these articles. So yeah, there is a link in the description below for the Marantz Cinema 70S in particular, but I can honestly say I am proud and excited to have Crutchfield as a sponsor of this channel because I have been purchasing products and more importantly been researching products and topics for my channel through Crutchfield for so long. So I can genuinely vouch for how much Crutchfield has helped me personally in my home theater journey, especially when running this YouTube channel. So before you go to Google, I would highly recommend going to crutchfield.com first. All right, back to the show. The coolest thing about the 70S is that it is literally in 2023, the AVR you can buy brand new that has a full set of pre-outs. All other seven channel AVRs on the market today do not have a full set of pre-outs. They have subwoofer outputs and maybe a zone two output, but that's it. This one on the other hand has a full set of pre-outs, which is super cool. Because one thing about this new menu system is that it is so much easier to set up pre-outs than it was in previous versions. So say if you're like me and you love to use external amplifiers, and you have external amplifiers, let's go into some scenarios where you would actually utilize those external amplifiers. So let's go to amp assign. In assign mode, say if you want seven ear level speakers, you just want a traditional surround sound system, you don't care about any height speakers, you just want to be surrounded and engulfed in audio that is ear level. So you would choose surround back, assign mode, speaker configuration, make sure all of the speakers are there, front, yes, center, yes, subwoofer, yes, surround, yes, surround back, yes. Okay, we're good there. So maybe you've run Odyssey, maybe you put in some manual distances, you've calibrated your levels manually or whatever, got your crossover set, your bass set, speaker connection, that is where we want to go. Right now, I have all of my seven ear level speakers set to pre out So that shuts off all the internal amps and I am using an Outlaw Model 7000X to power all seven of my ear level speakers. Boom, boom, boom. So this is what it would look like if you were doing that as well. Your front, center, surround, surround back are pre out only. That is when you're using a seven channel or perhaps a combination of external amps that add up to seven channels. But this is what it would look like in the speaker connection page. But say that you have an Emotiva Basics A3, a three channel external amp, and you wanna power your front soundstage, your front left and right, and your center channel with preamps. Since you're powering your front soundstage, your front and center, you would keep 
as pre-out only. But since your surrounds and your surround backs are going to be powered by your internal amps, you would change that to speaker plus pre-out. So that just means you're utilizing the internal amps, but technically it is also ready for the pre-outs to be used just in case. But honestly, there is no way to assign it to internal amp only, because as you can see, those are my only two options. So if you're utilizing the internal amps, speaker plus pre-out is what you want to assign it to. So yeah, this is what it would look like if you are powering your front left, center, and front right, and utilizing the internal amps to power the rest of your speakers. Pre-out only, speaker plus pre-out, speaker plus pre-out. Or say you have an Emotiva Basics A5 and you are powering five of your ear level speakers, you would set this to pre-out only as well. And your surround backs are the only speakers that are being powered by an external amp. See, this step used to be a little bit more confusing in previous menu systems with Denon and Marantz. But man, they made it so much easier this time around. So since I personally want to have all seven of my ear level speakers powered externally, I will once again set that back to pre-out only. But lastly, let's just say you only have a two channel amp, maybe a Basics A2, or maybe a really powerful two channel amp, say like a Peachtree Nova 300 or something. So since you're just powering two channels, say for example, you've got these gigantic tower speakers up front, then every other speaker you would set to speaker plus pre-out since only your front speakers will be powered externally. All right, since I know a lot of you aren't dealing with just seven ear level speakers, you're wanting a 5.1.2 Dolby Atmos configuration. Let's go into that. Let's say you've got front heights, right? And I mean, this is going to be the same with every other height channel configuration. But just for example, set it to the front height assign mode, back speaker connection. And now the only difference is that instead of surround backs, this is labeled as front height. So there you have it. So say you have five ear level speakers and two height speakers. Once again, you've got a really powerful two channel amp and you need all the rest of the internal amps to power your speakers. This is how it would look. Front is set to pre out only. Say if you've got a three channel amp powering your front left center right, change this to pre out only as well. That's how that would look. Say you've got a five channel amp and you wanna power all five of your ear level speakers externally, set that to pre out only. And then the only remaining that will be powered by the internal amps is the front heights. And once again, if you have a seven channel external amp or a combination of external amps adding up to seven and you want all of your speakers powered externally, boop, everything should say pre-out only. Booyah, grandma. But just so I can put you at ease, if you happen to have a different assign mode with your height speakers, let's say you've got upward firing speakers as set as surround Dolby because you've got upward firing speakers set on top of your surrounds, as you can see in this graphic here, it is still going to be the exact same when you're assigning the speaker connections. Boom, front, center, surround, surround, Dolby. Ah, if you need to use the internal amps for your surround Dolby, upward firing speakers set out to speaker plus preamp. Or if you have a three channel external amp powering your front sound stage, you would Set your surrounds back to speaker plus pre-out. I don't want to get too redundant here, but just going over some scenarios for you. But I hope that makes sense. It is so easy this time around with the menu layout as it was in previous versions. So kudos to you, Marantz and Denon. You made assigning pre-outs so much easier. And that's about it as far as your speakers. Boom, 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 boom. With the rest of the menu settings, I'm actually not gonna go into too much detail because it is completely up to you how you wanna customize your own system, but I'll just kind of generally go over what is there. Network, information, friendly name, Marantz, Cinema 70, yada, yada, yada. Connection, you can connect to it via Wi-Fi, or perhaps you wanna utilize the ethernet port that's on the rear for a more reliable connection. But if you do choose Wi-Fi, you can see down here, this is where you would do Wi-Fi setup. 
so you can connect to your Wi-Fi system, find your Wi-Fi router, and put in the password to connect to it, etc. Network settings. If you're a computer software engineer or tech savvy, you can have at it if you want. <laughs> Network control, always on or off in standby. Your network friendly name, like say if you're trying to search for something via Bluetooth, you can actually change the friendly name to something like home theater, living room, family room, guest room, kitchen, dining room, master bedroom, bedroom, den, office, other. And if you choose other, and you can actually customize the name itself. It doesn't have to be one of those previously assigned names. You can change it to whatever. You can call your Marantz Destiny or Stella, whatever. Apple AirPlay. And as you can see, Apple AirPlay name. If you're trying to connect your phone via Apple AirPlay to the Marantz, it'll show up in the menu on your phone as Marantz Cinema 70S because that's the default. But as in the previous page, you can change that to any name you want. Spotify Connect on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are both enabled. Yes, we do want that. Heos account. Yeah, if you're in the Heos ecosystem with some Heos compatible devices around your home, this is typically used for whole home audio. If you like to play music throughout the whole house or just in a specific room, you can control that via this Marantz AVR. General language, owner's manual, eco mode to save electricity. That's up to you. Bluetooth transmitter is for if you're wanting to connect, say, some wireless Bluetooth headphones to it. Because you can play music through this Marantz via Bluetooth, but to actually send or transmit a Bluetooth signal to Bluetooth headphones, you do need to turn this on. And then the output mode, say if you do want to send it to some Bluetooth headphones, you can set it to send it to your headphones and through your speakers or just your headphone. And device list, this is where you would set up connecting those Bluetooth headphones. Zone 2 setup, if you enjoy having a two-channel Zone 2 in another room, this is where you would set that up. And you can also change the names of your main zone in Zone 2 if you so choose. Smart select names, I honestly don't know what that means. <laughs> But uh, more power to you if you want to figure out what this does. Trigger out. Yeah, so if you are utilizing an external amp, just make sure this trigger out is engaged or set to on so that if you have a trigger wire connected to your Marantz, to your external amp, when you turn on your Marantz, it will automatically turn on your external amp as well. So pretty handy when you're using an external amp. Otherwise, it's not much of any use to you. You can change the brightness of your front display. Bright, dim, dark, off. I'll just keep it at bright. But uh, in a dark setting, you may want to change that. Who knows? Although with any Marantz front display, it's just that tiny little circle. So I don't think it's all that distracting anyway. Firmware, auto update, allow update which is one reason you might want to connect to a network via the Ethernet port, because that'll be a more reliable connection to do those auto updates. But by default, the auto update feature is off. So if you do want it to auto update when new updates roll out, then just set that to on. Let's keep it off for now. General information is just general information. Yay. If you want to hop on this bandwagon and send information to Marantz to improve or perhaps make any firmware updates in the future to let Marantz know that there are some bugs when particular things happen, you can choose to send this usage data to them automatically. But by default, it's set to no. Save and load. When you're setting up those presets, this is where you would actually save that configuration so that it knows Oh, this is the home theater configuration. If you don't want anybody messing with your setup or your configuration or all the customizations you've done, you can set this to on so that it's a lot harder to access the setup menu. But we'll just leave that off. And reset will reset it to default settings. Setup Assistant automatically happens when you first turn this on. But say you just told it to go away right at first. Maybe you want it to do things manually right off the bat. But if you wanted to go back 
and do the Setup Assistant again, because it'll run through not only your speaker configuration, but Odyssey room calibration, network setup so you can connect to the Wi-Fi, name changes, all that stuff. The Setup Assistant just helps you with all of those steps to get you set up and going. And that's about it, folks. That is your newest menu system in a seven channel Marantz or Denon AVR. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. I hope you learned something. I hope you have the ambition to do some manual tweaks because nobody's system is the same, nobody's room is the same, and we all need to make little tweaks to get it sounding just right or get it sounding the way you like it. Happy listening, everyone, and I hope you enjoy your Marantz or Denon AVR.